So imagine that you get an email from me, and when you open it, there's a, there's a short comment that says, isn't this amazing? And there's this wiring diagram. And you look at it for a little while until it makes your head hurt. And then you send back a comment like, oh, that's nice. And what you really wanted to say is, why'd you send this to me? I'll get back to this in a little while. So we seem to have this tendency in solving problems that we typically look at the situation that gets our attention and we want things to go back to the way that they used to be. And we look at it from the perspective of symptoms. And Russ Ackoff had a, had a real habit of saying, if you really analyze a situation, you are most likely to find that the real problem is never where you thought it was. We have, seem to have this passion for, for treating symptoms as opposed to actually dealing with the underlying problems that cause the symptoms that we find annoying. Now, in, in 1976, I had a life-changing experience when I read Stafford Beer's Platform for Change. I never looked at the world the same after that. Though, and I, I guess I thought I became a systems thinker. Though, for decades, people asked me what I did, and I told them, or started to tell them, you can see their eyes glaze over as they were probably asked themselves, why did I ask and how do I get them to stop? Because the idea is that we sort of end up embracing this concept and we want to sell it to the rest of the world. If you get a number of system thinkers together, it doesn't matter where the conversation begins, sooner or later it evolves to a point of talking about why isn't systems thinking more broadly adopted in the world. Though systems thinkers never seem to come to the realization of what I think now is, is really the right answer. The reason that systems thinking isn't more broadly adopted in the world is because of systems thinkers. Since Bertel Anthe's work in the, in the 30s, we have been attempting to sell systems thinking to the world, and, and it just doesn't work. There's a real amazing quote in the One Minute Salesperson by Spencer Johnson where he says, while almost everyone loves to buy, almost no one likes to be sold. And, and I was part of this problem, simply you know, attempting to sell systems thinking to the rest of the world, everyone that I met who didn't want to listen yeah, the idea is, how much of what I have to say are you likely to want to pay attention to right after I tell you you're stupid? So, I, you know, everything that you've learned about thinking is wrong, and, and I'm going to fix you. Well, you know, we've done that. And, and I was part of the problem. And I developed this systems thinking certification course, and everybody, everyone thought I was really presumptuous. And I probably was. And the first people that went through it gave me such reviews that I thought I was being had. And a number of other people went through it, and it continued until a couple of people went through it and finished it. And, and the reviews were really good, and then they said, how do I sell systems thinking to my organization? And, I, and I, it just crushed me because I knew that I had failed because I knew that it wasn't possible, though they asked the question and it warranted a meaningful answer. And I pondered it for several weeks and finally came to a realization which will get surfaced along the way here. So in terms of actually developing relationship models and, and inflicting them on the rest of the world, I, I did this for decades because I thought I knew the answer. You know, it's, some people are just really slow learners, and I guess I'm one of them. <clears throat> but in the process of doing that, I sort of, part of coming to systems thinking was from a system dynamics perspective, and I thought systems thinking was just a not very grown up view of, of systems thinking or system dynamics. Fortunately, when I came across uh, Michael C. Jackson's work, um, systems thinking, creative holism for managers, I realized, or from his perspective, understanding why it was that there were so many 
models and methods that claim to embrace the system's paradigm when he said, if you look at systems from simple to complex, simple being something that you could ponder that you might design and develop, to complex where you might, to a certain degree, come to understand them, and contrast that with the participants that are involved in trying to figure out how to deal with the situation from unitary to pluralist to coercive, where the unitary, the stakeholders are pretty much aligned in terms of, of beliefs and behaviors and objectives, whereas pluralists, they might become aligned in certain instances based upon an intent to coercive where these people never agree on anything. And within this matrix, he said, there are hard systems thinking and some of the typical approaches within that context are operations research and systems analysis and systems engineering <clears throat> to dynamic systems thinking, which is system dynamics and cybernetics and, and a number of things, to pluralist, where you can't do these kinds of things until you understand what it is you're trying to deal with. You have to come to some level of understanding so that appreciative inquiry, soft systems methodology, and these approaches help you come to an understanding so that you can move to the left. Whereas in the last category, there's emancipatory systems thinking and postmodern. So I finally had a, a way to, to go ahead and get a sense of why did we have so many models and methods that claim to embrace systems thinking. And, and as I realized that, I said to myself, who could possibly learn all this stuff? And every time I go to approach a problem, I, can't, I don't have the time or the resources to engage a, a dozen experts to help us figure out how to deal with this. So the question was, what do I do with this? Now, I mean, now that I got to this understanding about all these different models and methods, now what? So in the process of this, about the same time, I ended up reworking this model that I got from uh, Aronson, I think it was, in terms of, it was a relatively simple model in terms of, I'm a farmer and the crop eating insects, insects are damaging my crop. And in the typical response is to apply pesticides but I learned that year after year, I have to apply more and more pesticides to deal with the crop eating insects. So what else is going on here? And I realized that, well, the crop, I don't kill all of them so that they have births that create more crop eating insects. And, but still, it, there's some more going on here that I don't realize. By applying pesticides, the insects develop immunity, which results in more insects and more crop damage. And I have a the vicious reinforcing cycle taking me in a direction that I don't want to go. And additionally, because this problem didn't exist before I developed the crops, I realized that by applying pesticides, I'm killing the controlling insects that used to eat the crop eating insects, which leads to more crop damage. And I've got another vicious reinforcing structure taking me in a direction that, that I don't want to go. And in the process of doing this, and, and I must have rebuilt this model, which is extremely, and I know it's not a complete model, it's just an attempt to, to demonstrate a set of relationships and the implications of those relationships. And doing it over and over again, I realized, asking myself what it was that I was doing and I was beginning with the situation and I was asking the question, and what does this influence and what influences this? And I asked the same question over and over and over again. What does this influence and what influences this? And I continue to ask that question until I develop a set of relationships that give me a sense of, of what's going on. So from there, all of a sudden, 
there was this aha moment that caused me to have this connection between a model and a play. If you go to the play and you sit there and you watch the relationships unfold between the actors from one act to another, at the end of the play, you leave and you take the story with you. If it was done well, if it makes any sense. And it, as Bateson said, it's the pattern that connects. And all of a sudden, I understood what it was that I had been doing wrong forever, which was inflicting these relationships, these models, on other people. Because suppose the playwright walked up to you and handed you the script and five minutes later said, what do you think? There is no way that you could possibly comprehend or, or understand the extent of that play in five minutes, which is what I continued to do with the relationship models that I developed. I would simply develop them and send them to other people because I wanted to impress them with how smart I was, but you know, nobody ever cared. And I began to realize that the reason for sending models to other people was the hopes that they would ask questions that I wasn't smart enough to answer. So that between us, we could actually improve or evolve the model so it made more sense. So that this, this piece of wiring diagram that makes one's head hurt could actually be, <clears throat> I'm sitting at the table in the morning having a pleasant breakfast, and my wife yells down from upstairs, when are you going to clean up that unsightly growth beneath the bird feeder? I'm getting tired of looking at it. And when that happens, this whole set of relationships flashes through my mind as to how I got myself in this predicament. See, I typically deal with a lot of frustration on an ongoing basis, and it ruins my breakfast. But when I have a pleasant breakfast, it helps me deal with those frustrations. And for the past several days, I've been watching the birds outside on the railing, and it makes breakfast a lot more pleasant than it used to be. So I like this. So after this happens for several days in a row, <clears throat> I decide to install a bird feeder. I install the bird feeder because I believe that it will increase the birds at the feeder and the birds outside, which will improve my pleasant breakfast. And when I do that, it does. And it also improves the attractiveness of the garden, which results in more birds at the fe bird feeder, which adds to my pleasant breakfast. And things are just marvelous. And then I realize that the birds don't show up unless I buy bird seed. And if you've looked at the price of bird seed lately, it actually adds to my frustration. And the birds at the feeder create spillage, which increases the need to buy bird seed, adding to my frustration. And the bird feeder attracts the universal eating machine, which is squirrels. And the squirrels decreases the number of birds at the feeder, while they also increase the spillage and the need to buy bird seed, which adds to my frustration. And the spillage attracts rodents, which increases my frustration because I have to figure out what to do with them. And the unsightly growth, which I have to figure out how to deal with. And now the birds are pooping all over the railing, and I have to figure out how to deal with that and clean that up. So the question is, where's the problem? Where's the real problem in this environment? When I unfold this relationship model as a story, everybody seems to get it. But what they don't get is the real source of the problem. The problem is not the unsightly growth. It's a symptom. The problem is not a badly designed bird feeder that results in all this other stuff. The real problem in this environment is, is my stupidity. The fact that I, I looked at the current situation and I said the answer is to install a bird feeder and I never thought about all the rest of this stuff. And we do that over and over and over again. Though out of this, what happens, what, what happened to me was it caused me to, to rethink the way that I developed all of my models in the past. And 
and there have been dozens of them that I have finally managed to completely rework, so they unfold as a story, and I have a few hundred left to go. Though in terms of thinking about the way we deal with problems, which is where this started up here, we go ahead and we typically start with the current situation that bothers us, and we have some des desired alternative, which creates a gap, which causes us to develop some understanding and the strategy and adoption to move the current situation in the direction of the desired situation so that the problem goes away. The, there are difficulties that result in doing this, though, and that our understanding often creates uh, us to expand or evolve the desired situation, which results in scope creep, which is a, which is a vicious reinforcing structure. Or if it's taking a long time to move the current situation in the direction of the desired situation, the gap creates a pressure to settle for less, which causes us to diminish the desired situation, and we end up uh, with a drifting goals scenario. Uh, though in the process of doing this, seldom are we really aware of the complex and complicated nature of what it is that we're dealing with and the time and space separation of cause and effect, so that we develop this understanding and strategy and adopt it and come up with unintended consequences, which typically cause the current situation to get worse or create new problems that we have to deal with in future or both. So what would be more appropriate would be to actually do disaster avoidance when we develop the strategy to figure out how to avoid unintended consequences, and to an extent that's doable, though it's not absolutely possible. It's just, you know, we can take things to a certain extent, but I'm convinced that we could get better at this than we have been in the past. I mean, you, you often hear it said that the majority of today's problems are the direct result of yesterday's solutions, so that you end up with a set of relationships that talk about, here's the relationship between the way that we consistently do things and how we might improve them. And while that gives you a sense of the pieces, it doesn't provide much of a way as to how to go about it. And as I thought about it, I realized based upon different things that I've talked about so far in terms of all of the different methods and, and unfolding stories and the way that you need to have an ownership for things. You know, I mean, ask yourself, how often do people actually wash their rental cars? Not very often because it's, it's a question of ownership. Well, I know people that own cars that don't wash their own cars, like me probably, but you know, I wash rental cars even less. So if I begin with a situation, I have to understand who the stakeholders are. Those people who have direct influence who are, or who are influenced by the situation the, and understand the implications of the situation, come up with an ideal alternative, understand the assumptions that I'm making, many of which are typically wrong or unfounded that I have to ferret out because they'll get me in trouble. And this gap is is what induces me to understand the trends, the related components, the relevant interactions in developing a, a set of relations that enables me to understand what it is that I'm trying to deal with, understand where the boundaries are, find the leverage points, develop a new strategy, which is part a part that I seldom see, which is I'll, people will develop a set of relationships to understand the current situation though I don't see them develop a new relationship model that says, here's the way that things should be related in the future, because that tells them what, how to do the adoption and what to monitor for new trends to find out if they're actually accomplishing what they set out to accomplish. So it's, it's an ongoing attempt to understand how to approach situations to be better at accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. So in terms of the point about not being able to sell things to people, what, what you do is you try to create a clear insight compressed in time that allows the audience to have an aha moment 
so that they they then are buying into something as opposed to feeling like they're being sold. And I don't believe I've done this in less than 20 minutes. But um, in terms of where this ends up, I'm, by some I'm currently considered a heretic because I've sort of said, I've sort of personally poo pooed the entire arena of systems thinking and distilled it down to a single question in the question of ant. So that rather than going to someone who is who is attempting to deal with the situation and explaining to them that they should learn systems thinking and figure out and better understand how to deal with the situation, the approach is simply to ask them questions about relationships. So that I still don't ever talk to anyone about systems thinking anymore. People say, what do you do? And I say, I develop stories about relationships and their implications. The next question is, well, does that sort of relate to everything? And the response is, yeah, that's the curse. It makes it extremely difficult to stay focused because everything is unbelievably fascinating. So that's sort of the presentation and we can turn the things back on and talk about multiple bits and pieces, whatever's on your mind. Um, go ahead. Where's my camera? Is everyone, is everyone still there? Yes. Yeah, um, we're still here. Oh. I think this is a really timely topic. Uh, I couldn't find my window, sorry. Sorry. Uh, a number of us have been uh, trying to figure out very similar ideas. So, so this, so I, I never specifically start off even for a long time selling complex system governance. I'm just trying to work on the problems that the client was telling me for, and then eventually they realize that something's going on. That's it. That's it. And and then then they start asking the question, well, how did you make those choices, and how did you know? That opens up the discussion. But but clearly the outright selling, like we're doing over here at the start, that 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 that's a doom loop. You remember the you remember the movie, um, what was it? Um, the first Fight Club. The first yes. the first rule of Fight Club is not to talk about Fight Club. Yep. Uh, my approach is the first rule of systems thinking is not to talk about systems thinking. In terms of, of what um, Joe asked, made a comment about systems wiki that used to exist, um, that has sort of evolved. In, into this thing that I've been working on called And It's All Connected, which is actually public. Let me move this. Um, and it's attempt, my attempt, where the, where the wiki was just all over the place, to, to put stuff into an, an orderly sequence where one can look at the evolution of my thoughts over time and simply walk through the structure either by clicking on things and going there or simply navigating through it as though it were pages in a book. And there, it's probably about 50% finished, but I have, you know, probably a hundred videos to do. Okay. What? Well, Gene, I've got a, I've got a actually a discussion point on much of the development that uh, you looked at was a presentation of uh, not system dynamics model, but causal diagrams. Okay. So one of the uh, 
at least for me, one of the, the stumbling blocks is causal loop diagrams are extremely powerful in thinking about uh, broad relationships among different entities. Uh, when we start moving from the causal loop diagram into a full-blown system dynamics model, uh, it requires a reduction uh, to basically to, to calculus and looking at relationships and changes over time among variables. In, in, in many cases, the, uh, what gets lost between the causal loop diagram and the formulation of a, a formal systems dynamics model, uh, to me, we, we lose what we're actually achieving in the causal loop diagram. I'll give you a quick example of that. Yeah, I saw one fella, he developed a uh, system uh, dynamics diagram uh, or a system dynamics model, that was his task. Uh, and he had so many levels of complexity that by the time that uh, he was towards the end, he was convinced that his objective was to make the model run, not to solve the problem. Uh, so, he had to be putting in uh, dummy variables and, and moving things around to make the model run. So uh, your thoughts on the relationship possibly between uh, the causal loop diagrams as, as you saw and full-blown system dynamics models? So my understanding is that, that the development of causal loop diagrams was the result of a search for how to present the results of a system dynamics model in a way that that the audience could understand it, mm -hmm. uh, and and I agree with that. Though, and and there are some people who say that you should develop a, just system dynamics models and forget about cause and loop diagrams, and you know the. My own personal perspective is I find great value in causal relationship models because they're relatively easy to develop, which is also part of the curse, easier for people to understand. And there is, there is a utility to them until you get to the point of beginning to ask how long and how much or when because they're qualitative, they're not quantitative. So, so I use them primarily to, to support understanding and, and if I need to go to a deeper level of understanding, then I'll use this a system dynamics model. Though the way that I use it depends upon how I need to present things to the audience, how we need to interact. There was a time when I used to develop models for people, and I won't do that anymore. Because if I develop a model for someone, then I have to spend time explaining it to them. And then I have to, to figure out how to justify to them that it's, that it's valid. It's better if they develop the model themselves. And then they understand what's there because it's their set of perspectives. I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly right. I mean, the whole, my thought is that a model is a simplification of reality intended to promote understanding. And to the extent that it does that, it's useful. And if it doesn't do that, then we need to work on it some more. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Sometimes I get lost and I'm not sure if I remember where I started. Well, I, yeah, I, I think the important point, well, actually, I've always looked at the causal loop diagram as being an entry point into being further elaborated into a more formal system dynamics. So it's interesting. If, 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 I, if I need one, okay? In other words, there are times when the, the level of understanding that I get out of a system a causal loop diagram is sufficient for, for me or us to move forward and we don't need to have all of the details. We don't need to invest the time or the effort necessary to figure out all of the 
values and equations to actually make a model run. I, and I guess the, the, what I would offer is that system dynamics, uh, the, the very reduction to uh, the language of mathematics requires an abstraction for many complex problems that we're not capable of actually providing. And in that case, at least for me, the, the causal loop diagrams and even the uh, uh, the rich pictures from uh, soft systems methodology become uh, a much more interactive vehicle to try to draw out assumptions and come to a common frame of reference. Right, it's a, it's a common frame of reference, though it's not as, in other words, it's been repeatedly demonstrated that it is, it is beyond the capacity of human intuition to understand the implications of two or more interacting stocks. Just, they, they produce relationships, outputs that, that people can't infer from looking at the diagram. And personally, I think it's one stock in a delay. Um, So it, it, it depends on what you what you what do you think you need to know? What level of understanding do you think you need to be able to to deal with this situation? But I, but everything I currently believe could be wrong. Okay. <laughs> it has been so far. So what happened to figure out that even this effort is wrong? Say again? Started, what happens when you figure out, or if you figure out that this effort is wrong? Then I got to go redo all the models again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You've already done that. Well, you know, learn, learning is sort of, it, it's an ongoing trial and learning. I hate the other comment about whatever, the, the other statement, it, it's just trial and learning. Um, which is why, you know, the, the aha moments are often painful because of what the implications are. You know, I mean, you, you get to say, I got to go find 900 videos and throw them away because they're all wrong. I, I really like your, your point about the, the, the model basically under, unfolding the, the story uh, because the, uh, the further... The farther away someone gets from the construction of the model, I think the less likely they are to embrace that because the model has to be built on a whole set of assumptions that were not part of that building or unfolding of the model uh, that you couldn't possibly appreciate. Yes. So the trust, yes. The trust in the model uh, is, um, I've, I've seen lots of gigantic models put in front of uh, quote, decision makers have little trust in the model because they really don't understand it uh, and they were not part of the construction of the model. Uh, I've always been fond of saying that models don't make decisions, people make decisions. Yeah, yeah I, I have often told people that I think the, the Afghan strategy models set the discipline back 10 years. When it appeared on the front page of the New York Times. So, for for reference, where is it? This when you when you get this link, which the video will be here. There's two links here: storytelling with Kumu and storytelling with Insight Maker. There are two learning programs that I put together that will walk one through using um, Kumu to develop stories and one using Insight Maker to develop stories. It talks about how to use the, the storytelling features of each of those um, resources. I have a, I have a passion for um, web-based utilities as opposed to things I install on my computer. And the, while many of the, the stories I unfolded for you are older stories that were in Insight Maker, 
Um, the more recent ones are all done in, in Kumu. I, I worked with the Kumu developers for about two and a half years, and they gave me 90% of what I asked for. But I had to explain to them why I wanted it. So, um, Quick, quick comment uh, from uh, Paulinho here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm glad to uh, again uh, uh, chat with you in a different means. You and I had a, a discussion way, way back uh, about uh, systems or systems. Uh, it's been a long time. I don't think you still remember, but uh, uh, the, the comment that I have uh, has more or less to do with something you mentioned within your discussion on uh, uh, faulty within assumptions as cause and effect. So something could uh, might as well be a symptom. Uh, that's the word you used specifically. And I'm curious as far as whether you've encountered uh, and maybe a way to how you can map the issue of a pathology. Uh, I bring this up because I know you're uh, familiar with the work of Bill and he speaks of this idea that you know, we shouldn't be focusing on symptoms, rather we should be focusing on pathologies. Uh, and I know you are aware of Len, Len Truncal, and you've had encounters with him. How would you view uh, this idea of trying to map pathologies perhaps in systems thinking as a way to try to show uh, what is actually the cause of some of the failures you know, in the language of systems? I, I continue to, to say that we should not map system, we should map problems. So at the beginning, I think this is the problem. In the, the bird feeder thing, I start with the, the um, unsightly growth around the bird feeder, okay? Which appears to be the problem. If I start there, I simply go ahead and ask the same two questions over and over again. What influences this and what does this influence? And I, once upon a time, a blank sheet of paper was my absolute worst enemy because I always wanted to know where was I supposed to start. I wanted to start in the right place. I didn't want to be wrong. And finally, I realized it didn't matter where I started because it's all connected. So if I, if I approach understanding in an in a orderly manner and continue to ask about what does this influence and what influence is this, I will come up with a meaningful relationship map that that I then, once I understand it, I unfold it differently. So the, the story that I unfolded as the bird feeder problem didn't, was not unfolded the way that I actually figured it out. Because I started somewhere else. But once I built it backwards, and some from this way and from this way, once I all got it put together, and, and it's been revised, I don't know, a dozen times, the question was then, okay, how do I present this in a way that other people will comprehend it, which is not the way I built it. You know, the, the, uh, one of the recurring examples is this organization has been experiencing marvelous sales growth, month after month after month. And then all of a sudden it begins to level off. And then it begins to decline. So management goes and beats up on the sales folks because they're not doing their job. But the more they beat up on the sales folks, the worse they get. When someone finally comes in and, and does a real, develops a real understanding of what's going on, they find out that it's not a sales, the reason that the problem exists is because the sales, sales force has been doing a marvelous job. Production can't keep up with the orders, the backlog is growing, and customers are getting tired of waiting 
their product and they're buying from somebody else. So it's a growth and underinvestment problem, not the sales problem. Hmm? Or one I've seen, it's the warranty problem. It's the what? The warranty issue problem. <laughs> Uh, there's too many warranty claims, and people are unhappy with the product and don't want to find something else. Mm. That could be. Yeah. So, so you brought up the, mm. the Afghanistan uh, SD diagram. I actually know two people helped create it, and, and it was it was actually meant to be a story, and it was to try to help people understand all the parts of the problem. And, and it got totally twisted around when the picture hit the news. Yep. Uh, you know, so so it was it was really meant to, to try to help people understand everything they had to deal with, and in and and, uh, and and less about trying to figure out if I push this level, do I get that? You no, know, do I make progress here? It was more about how do I how do I make some progress here. And what are what are all the parts that help me and hurt? So. I don't know where it is at the moment. There's there's a it's it's a PA consulting picture. Right. No, there was there was somebody who who took that particular model and did a presentation of it explaining how you could look at it from a, a certain perspective and find out that there were a half a dozen elements that related that were really meaningful. And, and I thought I could find it, but I, I don't remember what it was. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> so so in, uh, in, uh, in the context of trying to solve problems, uh, the issue is not so much solving problems, as you mentioned earlier, it's more or less trying to explore and understand systems, you know, because if your aim is to actually solve problems, you know, you might actually solve a problem, another, another one emerges, so uh, more or less is to put people in the mindset of trying to always stay exploratory in nature. Otherwise, once you give them a solution, they think, well, this is the solution to the problems, uh, and once you, you put people into that mindset, if the problem doesn't go away, well, it, you didn't solve the problem because the idea is you want to be exploratory and complex systems don't have one particular solution. They change. Correct, which is why the, the idea of once you do an adoption, you have to understand where you need to continue to monitor the environment to look for those things that, that are, are going to surface to cause problems for the direction in which you're going. The, the things turn out to be problems that would not have been a problem beforehand because you, you change the, the behavior of the environment. The, which, which is why I, I, I really like the archetypes because they, they provide a sense of, I mean, most people look at archetypes as being negative things. If you look at the way situation is, they will give you a sense of how they are likely to evolve over time. Let me see, let me find this. So that if you, if, if you have a situation where you've developed a reinforcing structure and, and things are growing the way that you want them to, the first thing you should start doing is looking for those things which are going to become limits to growth because you know it has to run into limits. So, so rather than wait till you run into one of those limits which becomes a problem, you have to, to seek them out beforehand because you know they're going to show up. Part of the difficulty is we don't know how to reward people for dissolving problems before they become problems. We reward people for saving the organization, but at the 11th hour.
and also from continuing to look at and evaluate sets of relationships, it typically turns out that there are one or a small number of archetypes that are responsible for the core behavior of, of the structure that you're looking at. It's sort of like, you remember the, the, the movie Independence Day or Armageddon or any of those? They, they give you little snippets of stories and then they weave them all together over time. But it's, but it's those pieces that begin that, that have an influence throughout the entire, the entire story. <clears throat> the the uh, uh, the other question that I have, I guess, more or less an exploratory issue is uh, uh, when you create a wiki through Kumu, for example, uh, is the intent to teach people you know, uh, about systems uh, theory and uh, all those kinds of things, or are you, is this more like uh, creating a, uh, a database of knowledge that's out there that maybe a lot of people in government and business may not know? Um, I've heard of that issue also with uh, with Len uh, trying to create something associated with uh, his research. Uh, he's finding more and more that a lot of people don't have access to this stuff, and they are creating redundancies of these issues. <laughs> You know, what's, what's, uh, okay. what's so, the problem for you? So in, in the fall of 2009, I, I issued a challenge on the System Dynamics Forum and said, when are you people going to get your act together and give us an environment in which we can develop and share models and simulations without having to worry about do I have the right software? And shortly after that, I get this message from, from one Scott Fort Monroe, who was in Poland on a Fulbright scholarship, going to school, consulting, falling in love, and writing software. He said, boy, have I got a deal for you. So Scott Fortman and I, Scott Fort Monroe and I spent almost five years developing something called Insight Maker, which is a web-based modeling and simulation environment, which is completely free. Just go to insightmaker.com. It currently has about 110,000 registered users. There are 150,000 models in the, in the database at the moment most of which are public. These, these are my models, there are a few hundred of those. Um, and there is a learning program that was put together that talks about almost every facet of Insight Maker um, that's online that, that one can find, it's right here. Um, But it was it was done in it was done in Kumu, which was better to weave all the pieces together. But all the individual pieces of this are in are in Insight Maker, and for every one of them, there is a description and a video that you can watch that will go ahead and explain that aspect about the environment. So um, we, we felt that it was that important to have that type of environment available and the reception has been pretty good. I mean, it's that, it, it does, you can do qualitative maps you can do simulation for it, uh, and it also does agent-based modeling to to an extent, um, and it's free. 
We also wrote a book called Beyond Connecting the Dots, which talks about Insight Maker and modeling and simulation, which is now free also. Um, and, and at the time we wrote it, it's, it was kind of an interesting feat. Um, Scott Fortman Rowe is the genius behind all this stuff. I just test it. We wrote the book and he actually, Insight Maker was written in JavaScript, so it runs completely in the browser. He embedded the Insight Maker software in the book, so you can actually run the demonstration models in the book. So. Gene, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be kind of curious on your reflections of, sometimes when we talk to, to modelers, uh, building models, they will talk, they want to talk about <clears throat> verification and validation of their models. Uh, I'd be interested in on your thoughts on the uh, <clears throat> verification and validation of models with respect to the utility of the model. Uh, a little context maybe. <clears throat> In some cases, the, the purpose of a model is to try to inform or to come up with some, some common understanding of a problem or a situation. Uh, on the other end of the model, to actually be able to predict based on uh, sometimes large data sets, uh, be able to predict what is going to happen. So your thoughts on some of the models and stuff you've been working on and the role of verification, validation, and relationship to those? Yeah, the, all right, the, fir the first comment I'll make is people have this tendency of throwing around verification and validation, and, and typically they don't really understand how to differentiate between the two of them, okay? I, I can write you a letter, and, and I can interact with you, and I can address it to you, and I can ensure that the address that I put on the letter is the correct address. So I can verify it. Only the post office can validate it by delivering it to you. Okay. So I think there's a real difference between verifying and, and validation. You can verify it to say that it represents our best understanding for the moment, it's a date. The, the validation is, does it reflect reality? And part of the difficulty is that the data doesn't predict future data. Relationships do. So to the extent that, that it mimics or models or or is consistent with reality, as soon as some relationship changes the day after tomorrow that the model doesn't accommodate, it's, it's no longer valid. Mm -hmm. right? So you just, you know, it, it's, I can, I can demonstrate that it mimics reality up to today. But there is no way that I can prove that it will mimic reality tomorrow or the day after. Yeah, actually, I actually saw a modeler. Um, it was an interesting conversation with them. They, this was a, a several million dollar model that had been mm -hmm. an agent-based model. And uh, during that time, uh, the policy uh, had changed from a uh, decentralized philosophy to a centralized philosophy, and which changed the structure. And I asked them for their validated model. <laughs> they, uh, I said, what does that actually mean for you? And they, they scratch their head for a moment and say, you know, we'll have to go back and build another model. <laughs> another yeah, and I, I, I'm sure for them it was employment for modelers, but yeah, to me, when you have something, that, it made me think about when you were talking, 
when you have something that is, is very dynamic and shifting very quickly in the structure of the system, uh, to think that we will have sufficiently absolute knowledge that it can be predictive uh, is, is sometimes a far reach. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to, the, to the best of my understanding, this currently makes sense. We'll reevaluate and we'll reevaluate again tomorrow. I mean, if you, I mean, it's nice if if you can work with people that can can get their egos out of it. Okay. As I said, you know, it is quite possible that everything I currently believe, I currently believe, could be wrong. Then I I said before about. The reason for developing a model and sharing it with someone else and unfolding it in a way that they can understand is in the hopes that they will ask questions that I didn't think asked. And when they do that, the worst thing I can possibly do is argue with them. You know, uh, Covey said in Seven Habits, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Yeah. So it's one of one of in other words, I, I said that I developed this system simple certification course. And and after they asked the question about how do I sell system thinking to my organization, after I thought about it, I came up with a with a set of quotes that I thought sort of embraced my current understanding. And and one of them was People always, always, always do exactly what makes the most amount of sense to them in the context of the moment based on their current understanding, which says that if you do something that doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to you. And, and rather than argue with you about your behavior, the appropriate action on my part would be to understand it in the process of understanding, maybe both of us develop a better understanding. But as I said before, coming to you and saying, you're stupid, doesn't get us anywhere. The, the quote by Spencer Johnson was one of the quotes. The... Uh, the first rule of systems thinking is don't talk about systems thinking is another. And then there was a quote from Buckminster Fuller about, about fighting with the system. And then there was a quote from Lao Tzu about um, working with people so that in the end, they say they did it themselves. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible perspective for the consultant because if you succeed in the best possible manner, the people you work with will wonder why you were there. Because That's a consultant's nightmare? <laughs> well, you know, the, um, the people that you have managed to support and get them to develop a better answer, believe that they did it themselves. And, which, you know, um, one, one shouldn't attempt to be a white man. So I guess I'm good with that, at which time it's time to go. Oh, okay. So are, are we done? Is this? I was talking about my consultant. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry for the misinterpretation. Oh no, that's all right. <laughs> any any other questions? Uh, I, I guess that actually illustrates the the idea of uh, uh, why uh, uh, you know you understanding may dif may be different from the other, but if you give the other person a chance to explain themselves, you may actually come to a better understanding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, I, once, I once wrote a paper called Change Management, the Colombo Approach. 
and you probably remember Colombo, the detective, the TV detective, who who always had one more question about something that he didn't understand. So that if if you go to a department store and you, and you wander around and you're looking at stuff, and someone comes up to you and says, "May I help you?" The typical response is, "No, I'm just looking," or something like that. Though most people. I think don't realize that the the story that runs through their head immediately without them consciously thinking about it. How can this person be so presumptuous as to think I need help? I'm perfectly capable of helping myself. So now I'm just looking. So if you if you go to someone and, and ask them to help you understand. It brings them towards you rather than pushing them away. And you, you just but you have to learn how to ask questions that aren't terribly, terribly annoying. Because uh, people people don't do quite well with that. Either. But Chuck, you, to your, I think it was you made a comment about causal loop diagrams. Um, I had an experience that absolutely blew me away and gave me an appreciation for the extent to which people can learn to develop causal relationship models in a very short period of time. I was invited to do a workshop that I forgot was a workshop and I was prepared to present for far longer than even I would want to listen to me present. And over breakfast, I realized that I was supposed to be doing a workshop and I had no materials prepared. So as I was finishing my coffee, I developed a workshop, probably the best workshop I've ever done. I walked into this group of about 35 people and I said, take out a piece of paper. On this piece of paper, draw a dot and label it cat. A couple of inches away from it in some direction, Draw another dot and label it mouse. Now draw an arrow from cat to mouse and label it Casey. You have now developed your first relationship model. If you feel faint, you should leave now. And for four hours, this group was absolutely out of control. Um, within four hours, they were developing extremely complex relationship models and presenting them to each other. And the whole thing was done piece by piece by piece by giving them the beginnings of the bird feeder problem or environment and saying, what are the implications of these relationships? Ask yourself, what is this is what is that influence is it? And then someplace along the way, I talked to them about the difference between a savings account and a bathtub. And they learned about reinforcing and balancing structures. And it was amazing what they became capable, what, what they realized that they understood in four hours. So. And uh, a question which may have a follow-up question to it. Is there a comparability between your mind, storytelling and storyboard? Well, very interesting, and I hope he knows what he's talking about. I think that that you oftentimes you probably need to do a storyboard to figure out how to tell the story. To 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 clarify, no, the way that I talked about the way that I developed the relationship model is probably not the way that it gets presented. I need a level of understanding to sort it out. So I might use a storyboard to put this all together. Though I'm probably not, the way that I want to present it to the audience is not using the storyboard. I want to figure out how to tell them a story. In other words, 
would the storyboard for Iron Man be nearly as interesting as the Iron Man movie? Probably not. Uh, but it would be a much more rapid endeavor as opposed to making the movie. It would be a much more rapid endeavor, but would it communicate? I mean, the, the, the comment or the thought about uh, stock and flow models as opposed to call, cause and loop diagrams. Yeah. So the follow-on follow -on question is, in the past I've been dealing a lot with the issue of uh, the methodology called Agile, as well as the systems thinking. And where would you place storytelling within the context of design thinking and agile. I, I would prefer not to talk about either of them. What, what, does, what does agile mean? It's, it's just a, it, it, it's, it's a what? It's a collection to imprint and try to change the culture. It's like CMMI, it's totally culture as opposed to potentially what is the methodology associated with design thinking. Uh, okay, and what, what is design thinking? See that? More often than not, I find the labels more confusing than helpful. The only thing I ever talk to people about are relationships and their implications. Which, which is why there, you know, there are a number of people who, who have come to the conclusion that I'm a heretic. <laughs> Gee, I kind of feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> I've been talking about this language issue now for what a few a few months, and you know it just seems like our language turns people off, and they just they just glaze over, and that's that's the end of end of the conversation. So we have to bring it back into some common terms and use language that they understand. I'll agree with that, which is you know I have yet to unfold the bird feeder model to anyone who didn't get it. They just, ah. Yup, it ain't firing on cylinders two and three. Want to say that again? I sent something out last week. Uh, a, a long, a man walked into a uh, r repair shop with his car and the guy goes in and does some does some analysis comes in tells him his long dissertation about about uh, the auto cycle and and uh, you know this that and the other thing and finally he says yeah but the real the real thing is it's just not firing on two and three you got a blown head gasket <laughs> yeah no and, you know the thing the the comment I made earlier about you know, I used, to, I used to send my models to people because I wanted to impress them with how smart I was. And they never really cared. So, the, you know, to send models to other people in the hopes that they can help you better understand seems to work far better. Is Caitlin there? I'm here. Hi, Jean. Thank you for the invitation. Welcome. I'm, I'm glad that you came. I invited uh, you on his birthday without realizing it was his birthday. Oh, so. well, happy birthday, Jean. <laughs> happy birthday. Oh, well, yeah, that was last week. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm now retired one year longer. But uh, <laughs> Awesome. So I was I was checking out the Cumio tool um, just now. And uh, 
I'm, I'm really fascinated by it. So I haven't actually made a map before. So I was checking out the, the samples that you have and uh, it looks really cool. So there's, there's really, it, it's not like you can, uh, you just move all those nodes around, right? They just kind of repopulate. Oh, okay, so, so what, what you're looking at here was developed with Kumu. Yeah. Go to kumu.io. Yes, yes, that's what I'm at right now. All right, which, which is also free. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you want to do, develop uh, um, private models or some additional features, you can get an organizational version of it, but all of the features that one would normally use are, are right there. And, and if somebody wants to learn Kumu to develop relationship models, I provide 15 minute introductions for free because I think it's just awesome. <laughs> so uh, is there a way to export Kumu to kind of an offline uh, format, like video or something. Well, you you can you can you can export okay. the elements in the relationship to a spreadsheet. Uh -huh. Though there isn't much you can do with them in a spreadsheet except import them back into uh, another um, Kumu model. You can also export them in a uh, JSON format, which will save the, the labels, the connections, the positions, all the content. See, from, from this environment, every one of these elements, well, that's because I, you, know, you there are elements on the model, and there are, um, a profile page on the left for every element, right. okay. which which is really nice. But this also has something turned on that does a mouse over so that all of those elements, the content pops up when you mouse over them. If you look at something that actually has, uh, let me go back to storytelling for understanding. Let me go to this. No, that doesn't have some. All right, hold on. Insight Maker will allow you to develop relationship models, but it doesn't understand anything about loops, really. Uh, if you just, uh, this is this is another one that everybody gets quite easily, which is. This is a relationship model for the boy who tried wolf. Notice that if you mouse over this, everything else goes away so that it will tell you where the loops are. And so I also noticed that, um, I don't know if this model does it, but one of the samples that was on the home page, you could actually drag a node and recluster it on another part. Is, uh, is that like an optional thing, or does this diagram, for example, can you grab a node and, and shift it over somewhere else? Shift it over. Like, I mean, like, it, like relocate it to like 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 drag and drop it. Drag it uh, on the home page where you can actually drag one of the nodes and then it like went over somewhere else and uh, it was the Congress one. On the whole page, I, saw. I mean, see, you, you can you can move them, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. And all the connections stay connected. Um, this one doesn't have any connections. I'm looking at a the Civic Canopy 2014 Symposium, so it's just kind of like, like that you could just drag around. So I was just checking out some of the samples they had here on the website. It's really cool. But if they, but so this one doesn't have the nodes, but or I'm sorry, the connections. But if you did have connections there, you could, see, you, they would maintain those links as you move them? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, mm, you could almost model kind of the effect of if you, if you had like a lot of stakeholders in a mapping like this, if you were to kind of 
move them in other places, you could see how there's there could be paths being crossed or things like that. I don't know. I'm just well, it's okay. It's hard to describe the extent of the capabilities of Kumu because I said I worked with them for two and a half years and I wanted to do storytelling and they gave me 90% of what I wanted. They spent the last three years since then adding new features that I don't have any use for but the product gets deeper and deeper on an ongoing basis. Right. So not only can you use it to do relationship models, you uh, da, 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 so, uh, hold on. Let me see. Um, ah, where is it? Oh. Oh. Might have to draw another um, sorry, I'm I'm looking for something that I don't know where it is at the moment. It's okay. Um, um, we had another question here too. Okay. Um, I'm curious though. Okay, so uh, the bi-directional link, so like like wants attention and cry wolf. If you wanted the arrow going the other way, can you actually change the arrow to be both ways? Okay, cool. You mean, um, I said, you know, yeah. if you want an introduction to Kumu, I'm happy to provide. Okay. okay. Now, because, all right. Because there are an unbelievable array of things that you can do in this environment, I, for people who wanted to do relationship diagrams, I created a template. See, that the nice thing about Insight Maker and Kumu both is any model that exists, you can clone to make a copy of it that belongs to you. So this is a, a template that I created that talks about a savings account in a, in a bathtub. And there's a video that talks about how this is all put together and where the help is and pictures and a whole bunch of other things. And it's got all of the things to find so that this has predefined different types of, of loops, whether they're reinforcing or, or balancing and stabilizing, whether or not the um, individual relationships are adds to or subtracts from. And you can define these to be anything you wanted to. You could have these with plus and minus signs if that's what you wanted. Right. I mean, that's the difficulty is the power of the environment makes now makes it confusing to people who are just getting introduced to it, which is why I created the template so we can just clone this and start developing a model. Okay. And if you you, you can find all of my content at kumu.io slash stw. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And in the same, in other words, I don't, I don't have any models that I've developed that are um, private. Every, everything is public. So that anything that I have developed, you could find a copy of and just clone it to use as a basis for creating something else. Okay. Anything else? Uh, oh.
Going once? Going twice? Old American. Uh, I don't have any questions. Not any uh, any from uh, okay. any of our other folks? Jim or Joe or? I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, right. I'm probably good, but the next time I'm down in, in the Outer Banks, which might be this weekend, I'm not sure, maybe we can meet for lunch at the Salt Box. Yeah. Great place. Absolutely marvelous. Yeah, Randolph lives about two houses down from where I, uh, oh. I have a house on Collington. Uh, on, great, uh, great guy. Chamber. Yeah, yeah. You might take that as an invitation for the entire learning community. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. So I'll I'll uh, I'll send everybody that was on the distribution list a link to to this particular model right after I get the video sorted out and and linked in and and um, you, you all, because my email address was in the email you all found out so. Okay, Don't hesitate to send me an email. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Gene, and uh, we really appreciate you taking your your time and spending it with us. And uh, thanks to Katie for uh, for actually making the link. And oh, and do any do any of you remember uh, Barry Clemson? Yes, we do. Yes. Chuck my and hero. I do for sure. <laughs> my hero. <Yeah. laughs> I, I I probably read his book fifteen times before I got it. Which one? The story about how the editor made him change the title. Cybernetics, the new management science. Yo, he wrote a novel too about Denmark. Yeah. I read that. Yeah, he, uh, the, the editor thought that it, or the publisher thought it would sell better. He hated that. He always hated that name. <laughs> so, the, so the chain gene is Stafford Beer had a student named Barry Clemens. Barry had a student named Chuck Keating. And we're all Chuck's students. <laughs> so, yes, we know Barry. Right. Either, 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 either in person or by diffusion. Okay. It's called a chain of intellectual custody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. On that note, I'm out of here. Take care. <laughs>